We are finishing uh, the messages we've put together based on John's little letter, five chapters, a magnificent letter called 1 John. He also wrote 2 John, 3 John, just three little letters, and the Gospel of John and the Book of Revelation. And um, in these messages, John is saying to us, or he's saying that Jesus is saying to us, if you love me, follow me. And I've shared already, by walking as I walk, by loving as I love, by overcoming as I overcame, by withstanding all antichrist just as I had to, by relying on the Holy Spirit just as I did. And uh, you see this coming through, this older man now who walked with Jesus and who learned how to follow him, he is appealing to Christians to say, if, if you really love Jesus, if you love, Jesus is saying, if you love me, follow me by these things. Today I want to share just three final comments and I'm going to bridge it chapter 3, 4 and 5 and, and I trust you've enjoyed reading um, the, the passages. But uh, in number 6, if you love me, follow me by living with the purging hope of eternal life. You might say, wow, that's a strange one. What do you mean by that? Well, it's actually what he says in 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 to 3, he says, Dear friends, now we are children of God. Now. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him, what do they do? They purify themselves just as he is pure. Throughout these five chapters, he is saying to us the Christian life is a process of becoming more and more like Christ. So I became a Christian when I was 17, and I trust now in my 60s, I'm becoming more and more like Jesus. There needs to be progress. And John is assuming here to say if you're a follower, you have to become more and more like Jesus Christ. In Romans 8, 29, Paul says, For those God foreknew, he foreknew you, and he predestined you to what? To be conformed to the image of his Son. Wow. And in this process, he says, it's not going to be completed until we see Christ face to face. 1 Corinthians 13, 12, Paul also says, For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Folks, when we know what our ultimate destiny is and where we are going, it motivates us to keep morally and ethically straight and free from the corrupting influence of sin and from living a, a, an ordinary life, a self-centered, self-absorbed or, or, or selfish life. And John here links holiness to hope. And he's saying, I want to stimulate you. I want you to get motivated to live differently to those around about you. And in 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 to 13, he says this, and this is the testimony God has given us eternal life. If you're a believer in Jesus, he has given you eternal life now to live the best possible life here on earth and to live forever with him when the day comes when you have to meet him. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Do you have life here this morning? Yes. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. People of God, the hope of heaven is not just a, a mere wish. Oh, well, I hope one day, I wish, I, I, maybe I might get there. He, he's saying here, it's not a mere wish, but an unshakable confidence concerning our future. We were created to live forever in God's heaven. And it's now realized through our faith in Jesus and what he accomplished for us by his death and resurrection. That's why Paul says in Romans 5 too, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. You're going to see Jesus face to face one day. You're going to see the full glory of God one day. Heaven is more real than even life here on earth. 
And whatever image you might have of heaven, it's probably wrong. But uh, when you see the symbolic nature of, of, of when John talks about heaven in the book of Revelation, he's saying, man, when you get a glimpse of it, when you go there, you won't want to come back here on earth. So no, we're not going to be sitting on a cloud looking like a fat little angel playing a harp and singing a song for the rest of eternity. That's a medieval kind of weird. Imagine just singing one song for the rest of eternity. C.S. Lewis presented it well in, in his imagery, in his books, when it says, it's everything we have here on earth, but so much more real. If you think life is real now, because when you get to heaven, it'll be more real. So the air that you breathe is so real, it'll burn your lungs. When you walk on the lawn, it's so real, it's like your feet are going to be cut. When you smell a rose or see a rose, you say, man, I've never seen a rose like that. Of course not, because you're seeing it with sin-cursed eyes in a sin-cursed world. When sin has been removed and the curse has been removed, then you can say, I've seen a rose and I've smelled a rose. It's going to be everything we have here on earth, like the Garden of Eden. And the end of the book of Revelation says, it's like a new Garden of Eden is going to be developed and it's going to be fantastic. That's the image we have of heaven. It's not make-believe. It's real. If God, our heavenly dad, has chosen you to be one of his kids through his son dying on a cross in your place, then he is going to bring you home to heaven. Guaranteed. One of our beautiful women in the church, Penny Giacumas, went to be with Jesus on Friday morning. For those who, who uh, knew Penny... She was 90, and the mother of Michaela and, and Bill and uh, Dawn and Chris, and, and uh, I met with the family last night, and, and uh, Michaela and Bill are here, and condolences to you guys on behalf of the church. But what a magnificent person Penny was. Last time I saw her was when she came to our home for the seniors lunch that Kathy puts on once a year, and, uh, and she came cheeky as can be. Like, she's a straight shooter. I mean, here was a woman... And when she came to Christ, she got on fire for Jesus. That fire never dimmed all her years. She was full on for Christ. And so you wouldn't want to cross her either. So she came with this beautiful dessert. And I'm, th and I'm, I'm lusting after it. I'm saying, mmm. And she goes, Pastor Bill, this is just for you. Don't give it to them. So I hid it from my wife, my kids, my grandkids, and gobbled it all up on my own. Thank you, Penny. It was beautiful. <laughs> but I tell you, she was a powerful witness. Do you realize the whole Kipitogli family, Pastor Chris, Effie, and the whole family, really came to Christ through her? Effie was just, a, a, just newly married, 18, had arrived in Australia, and was, was kind of seeking after God. And it was Penny, that visiting her, her mother-in-law, that noticed... Effie's interest and invited her to church and, Penny got, and, and Effie got saved that Sunday and, um, and so and a, a, wonderful, a wonderful human being and uh, Effie also said to me that Chris was working as she's racing to hospital to, to, to have the babies and, and it was actually Penny that took her to hospital both for Sophie and, and for, uh, for Michael and so uh, I'm thankful for her because really if it wasn't for her leading them to Christ I wouldn't have my beautiful grandchildren through Michael and Stephanie. So, uh, but look, she, she was powerful, straight talker. Kathy just told me that Jean Zuma said that when she visited in the hospital, she had the names of Jesus on a piece of paper stuck down her, her front. And uh, every, every time the nurses would come, choo, Jesus is close to my heart. These are his names. So they took it off her anyway. So Jean gave her, uh, uh, Jean gave her another one. And so they couldn't stop her. And so... <laughs> So, dear soul, and so she, after uh, being in our home, um, she fell over a couple of days later, so she busted her, her hip, and she was basically on the mend, but suddenly had a uh, uh, heart uh, turn, and, and she went to be with Jesus really quickly, which was a mercy, if you know Penny. She would have made a terrible long-term patient. And so it was a mercy that the Lord took her home. And so uh, it looks like we'll probably have the funeral early in the week, maybe on Wednesday morning. We have to check with the funeral director. So just keep an eye on the, um, uh, the advertiser. We might just send you an email when we have the details later this afternoon. 
But, uh, you know, the thing that hit me with the kids, seeing McKellar and, and Dawn and Chris, the, the three siblings, is they're absolutely assured they know where their mum is. She's in heaven, real. And, uh, and so, like my, you know, as I'm talking to them, I'm thinking, it's just 10 years ago that my dad, and I know he's in heaven, I know my mum is in heaven. I don't know how people, people don't cope with death. And so this is an assurance. This is an assurance. And some of you have lost loved ones in recent times. They're in heaven. That little baby, that, that, that the West, Stephen Merrill's little granddaughter, uh, born, stillborn from David, just, just the other day, last week. And we know that little baby is in heaven. And she'll be growing up in heaven. And why that happens, we don't know. But we just know she's, she's in a better place. She's going to grow up there rather than on earth. So just keep David West in your prayers. For those who know David, he was here Pastor Steve's and Marilyn's son. But this is real. He's chosen us as his kids and he's going to bring us home to heaven and we're going to see him. So by living with the purging hope of eternal life, because when you, you have this hope, this amazing hope, it, it inspires you to want to live a holy life. You say, if, if God has done this for me, then I can't take it for granted. I've, I've got to live in conformity to his will. I need to do what's the right thing. So Lord, help me. Resurrected Christ who now lives in me through the Holy Spirit, help me to walk the talk. Help me to really be an effective witness like Penny Giacumis was, powerful witness through to the very end. Seventhly, he's saying, if you love me, Jesus is saying through John's letter, follow me by living with continuing love for your spiritual family. 1 John 3, 14. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. He says, look, the characteristic that you are a Christian is that you, you you're a ter- become a terrific lover. You cannot be a Christian and not be a loving person or becoming more loving. And he says, look, if, if, you, if you're not loving, you're still dead. You're dead in your sins. He's basically saying, this is John the straight shooter, look, you can't be a Christian if, if you're filled with hatred towards people and bitterness and anger and retribution, we know that we've passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Look at 1 John 4, verse 12 to 13. I'm jumping from chapter 3 through to 5 here. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, get these words, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. So his spirit lives within us. Now, I shared about walking in love a couple of weeks ago, and you might think, I shared a fair bit on that first message. But I've got to say it again, because John uses the word love 43 times in five chapters. I think he's trying to get something through to us. Like, you know, like blind Freddy can can see that to say, Okay, you're talking about love all the time. He is saying this has got to be the chief characteristic of the Christian. He so cuts through when he says that the God whom no one has ever seen can be seen in those who love. This is the evidence that Christ has risen because he now lives in us and loves through us. Our practical loving conduct towards one another verifies his presence. It's proof positive that he is alive and risen and still lives John is not telling us how many people to love but how much we are to love the people we already know so our job is to faithfully love the people God has given us to love whether it's two people whether it's 20 people whether it's 200 people and what's more if God sees we are ready to love others He will bring other people into our orbit of influence. And then he can entrust you to have more people come into your life. He will bring them so that the love that's in you can be displayed towards them. And that is how witnessing about Jesus Christ, who he is and what he did on the cross, takes place. Folks, love is our biggest evangelistic tool. It's the number one method of spreading the good news about Jesus to lost people. Because Jesus' physical presence is no longer with us in this world. And the only way people can see and, and, and hear and meet Jesus is in churches like ours. Yes, through you and through me. 
It's the only way. That's what John is saying. The Easter, we had a fantastic Easter. And, and at the end, Thursday night, Friday morning, and Sunday morning, I didn't go Friday night, that was the young adults' dinner. They said that was fantastic as well, that Lockie organised, they preached here, had about 10 non-Christian people. And I'm so thankful for so many of you that brought along friends, along. But on the, after Easter was finished, you know, I was so filled with thanksgiving to our team that, that did so well, the work, the effort the prayer foundation they laid. They were powerful meetings, the presence of God. And I was so thrilled and thankful, and yet I was also, I came away depressed, actually, and a little bit discouraged. You must say, how is that possible? Because I thought, this place should be full Thursday night and Friday morning and Sunday morning. We should pack every seat out. We've got 900 or so men, women and children as part of the church. All together we had about 1,100 people. That includes visitors. That means a lot of our own Christian family centre people didn't come or didn't bring anyone along. And I'm kind of grieving as, and rejoicing. And then, as I'm pointing the finger at you, <laughs> three fingers were pointing back at me. And I became terribly convicted in that we've got two new neighbours in our just near us, and we've started to talk with them, and I've talked to one of the couples really well, and Kathy to, to one of them. But, you know, we were so busy. We were so busy that we just forgot to invite them. And I reckon they may have taken the invitation. So I felt, I didn't feel guilty in the sense of, of you know, we're, we're, we're guilt and shame-free, but I just felt the Holy Spirit say, don't condemn Look at your own life. So I want to speak straight to you this morning about this. And I'm preaching to myself. Our teams put on the best services for Easter. Our Mother's Day service coming up in, in two weeks' time. What an opportunity. All the kids and grandkids in here. It's going to be a fiasco. <laughs> noise. And, but joy. Heavenly noise. What an opportunity. Grandfathers, mothers, bring along Uncle Fred. Bring along that difficult auntie. Bring that neighbour. Bring that grand. Bring anyone along to see little Flo do her thing. And we'll guarantee we'll share the gospel with them. We need to wake up to the opportunities. But you know what? I can't force you to do it. I can't force myself to do it. Do you know what's going to do it? Is, is love. If, if, if the love of God is really flowing in my heart, I won't forget. But I will be thinking. I have prayed for them, but I just missed the opportunity out of the busyness of life. So I want to encourage you. Encourage you in this. See, God's, God's love sends us into our personal world. Because he sent his son into his world. And, and, and he, gave, he came to give, and he came to serve, and he didn't count the cost. And so easily for us to be so caught up in our own lives, which are very important, but not thinking of those who don't know Jesus Christ. May the love of God melt your heart, not condemn you, but drive you and motivate you to say, you know what, I'm going to take advantage of every opportunity to share the message of Christ Can I say, can I hear an amen on that one? Yeah. Are you saying, I've just told you off and you're saying amen. You're saying, you're saying, give me some more, Pastor Bill, yeah? No, no, I haven't told you off. I'm, I'm talking to myself. But it's very real. And it's very serious. Heaven and hell are real. People need, God wants people to populate his heaven. He wants to snatch them from the jaws of death. And this is real and, and, and it's something that must pulsate within our hearts and our lives. So, my brothers and sisters in Christ, how clearly do your actions say you really love people? The truth is that the real test of our love for the Lord shows itself in how we treat people who are right in front of us. Your husband, your wife, your children, your grandchildren, your extended family, those you work with, those you're at school with, university, 
your immediate neighbours, and of course your spiritual brothers and sisters who belong to our church family. If the church is the body of Christ on earth, then she must reflect his character in all of her relationships. To encounter Jesus and to encounter his love is not through some mystical vision. I mean, I've had people have mystical visions of, of the love of God and then they go and do something that's not in the best interest of another person. Or they get all gushy and syrupy. I love you, love you, love you, love you, love you. Give me a hug and a kiss and, you know, love. It's all feeling oriented. Well, I'm not a lovey, gushy, huggy kind of person. You can hug me once a year if you like. That's fine. But I tell you what. To encounter Jesus' love is not through mystical visions or syrupy words, but by practical down-to-earth actions. You know what it is about? It's about taking up a towel and picking up a bowl and washing somebody's feet. And Jesus did that just before he died. I've had my feet washed by a dear pastor friend who went to be with Jesus, Pastor Keela, in Papua New Guinea, Pastor Keela Warri. When we dedicated the new facility at Port Moresby, 1996, the Papua New Guinea pastor said, we want to wash the, the, the feet of the pastors, the Australian pastors. Well, I mean, I was like, sure, I'm glad I washed my feet this morning. <laughs> like, you know, you think carnal thoughts. Oh, what are they like? Anyway, so I'm, I'm, I'm feeling really uncomfortable taking my shoes and socks. That's very intimate. Your feet are very intimate, like... And, and so and I'm all self-conscious and, you know, my space is being invaded and, and he's coming up close to me and all the pastors, you know, to me it was like you're half naked with his shoes and socks off. <laughs> and, and Keela starts washing my feet and he starts caressing my feet and he starts weeping over me as he's praying for God's blessing on me. Wow, it was like I just broke. My tears are welling up and I'm thinking, what? <sighs> What an act of, of love, of humility, of selflessness. Then the Aussie pastor said, we can't be outdone, so we, we went and washed their feet. And, um, and so Jesus is saying to us in that very act, you've got to find people's feet to wash. I mean, I'm proud of Kathy. She's a great foot washer. I mean, I'm so thrilled that Penny was able to come to our house just before she went to hospital. And to, so we can bless our seniors once a year and to really just have them in our home. And I've said to our pastors, we're going to be the servants. We serve them. We bless them. Just have all those that are, what, what age? Over 75? Over 70. When I turn 70, it's going up to 75. <laughs> then 80, then 80. Anyway, but it, it's great. And, you know, like, and I've taken up this habit. Kathy's taught me this, that at times she'll be at a shopping centre and might see a dear older person who is just counting their dollars and buying one can of tuna rather than what we buy is 25, you know, or, you know, how careful they are with their pension. And she has often just signaled to the, to the person saying, I'll pay it. So she pays it, and the person then realises somebody paid it and look at her, I followed suit. I've done that a couple of times, and I tell you, it's a great feeling. It's just terrific, because what you're doing is you're taking up the bowl and you're washing somebody's feet, someone who's less fortunate, but thinking of others and without any ulterior motive. And 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 on, on one of the occasions, I didn't even say anything to the person. They just looked at me, and I looked at them, and uh, and they just walked off. But you just know, maybe in 12 months, nobody has done an act of kindness towards that person. Right. You're Jesus to the community. And I tell you, if the love of God, and it's got to be a generous thing, generosity of spirit and heart and time and money and effort. And uh, I encourage you to, to do that. Take a, pick up a bowl and wash somebody's feet and bless them. So whose feet do you need to wash this week? Somebody at work, somebody in your neighbourhood, 
It may mean baking some food for them. It may mean just, just blessing them in writing them a, a beautiful letter. Just writing them a letter. I know what I'm going to do this week. I am going to write a letter to somebody. And I know who that person is. And they're, they're going to be blown away. They're not part of our church here. But I felt I needed to write to them. That's, that, that, I'm very busy. There's no interest. That person's not going to give me anything. They're not going to be, I'm not doing it so they come to church here. But I just thought, I, I want to bless them with some kind words. And so their feet are going to be washed. And when they read that letter, I trust it will melt their hearts and, and, and it'll do something that they'll see Jesus in that letter. Whose feet do you need to wash this week? 